Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7, and I'll be reading verses 11 through 17. And this is what it says. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a city called Nain, and his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her and said to her, Do not go on weeping. And he came and up and touched the coffin, and the bearers came to a halt. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Fear gripped them all, and they began glorifying God, saying, A great prophet has appeared among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread throughout Judea and in all the surrounding region. Pray with me. Lord, may we give praise to you, give thanks to you, so much so that people report about the great, great deeds that you, you're still doing, not just did a long time ago. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, sometimes you just never know where God's going to show up. I remember years ago, I was at a, a funeral in Rome, Georgia. I wasn't officiating the funeral. It was a funeral of a friend of a father. A father of a friend, I guess that's the way that goes. <laughs> and the service was done, and then we were going to the cemetery. And uh, we lined up to go to the cemetery, and I was about the middle of the procession. There were about 15 cars in front of me and about 15 cars behind me. And as soon as the, the police escort began to lead the procession, off in the distance, I could hear a train whistle. And then my imagination began to run. I, I began to think, well, what would happen if a train ran right in the middle of a funeral procession? Well, I was about to find out because the gate came down right in front of me. There were 15 cars in front of me and 15 cars behind me. I had no idea where the cemetery was. And with all of my effort, I was trying to, to look between the cars as, as a, a train car passed. I was trying to look to see where the procession was on the other side. And every time I looked, it, looked, it, it seemed as if the procession was getting farther and farther. And I was hoping, well, maybe they left a police car on the other side to take a, me and the 15 cars behind me to the cemetery. Or, or, or at least a note or a carrier pigeon or something that would let us know where the cemetery was. Well, as soon as the train passed, the other side of the tracks was nothing but wide open spaces. <laughs> oh, and I thought, what am I going to do? I, men, you'll be glad to know I did not stop and ask directions. I wasn't about to turn in my man card that day. I did what every self-respecting man would do. I bluffed. There was only one cemetery that I knew of in the town of Rome. 
And so I, I, I drove straight to that cemetery, hoping that I wouldn't lose the 15 cars behind me, but kind of hoping that maybe they'd get stuck at a traffic light or something. And as we pulled up to the cemetery, there was the, the front end of the procession parking their cars and getting out. Now tell me there's no God. Sometimes it's just so obvious. God shows up when you don't expect it. God shows up when you don't expect it. That's exactly what goes on in the story right here. It's a funeral procession. They're coming out of the town of Nain. And Jesus is with a, it says a large crowd. We don't know how, the other places in the Bible when it says large crowd, it means 5,000 or 4,000. We don't know how many, it just does as a large crowd. And Jesus and his large crowd pull over to let the funeral procession come out. They aren't expecting anything. Nobody says, hey, that's Jesus, let's see if he can help out here. No, they're just coming out. And Jesus, it says in verse 13, felt compassion for the woman. Her only son had died. He was the one in the coffin. And Jesus felt compassion for the woman. And it says that he came up and he touched the coffin. And then he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And that's exactly what happened. Well, that's so obvious that God showed up. Nobody would deny that. But before he ever said those words, arise, there's something very, very, very important in this story. Verse 13. Verse 13. It says that Jesus felt compassion for her. Now, it would be an obvious thing it, you, when, you know, blind Bartimaeus called out to, or cried out to Jesus. Jesus could see him and know that he was blind. And, and, and that would be a natural thing because Bartimaeus cried out to him if he felt compassion. Or the ten lepers, that they called out to him from a distance away. And, and it would be obvious that if they called out to him that he would feel compassion for them. Or the woman who, who felt the issue of blood and she was slowly dying. She tugged on his robe. But this, Jesus felt compassion for the woman before anybody cried out, before anybody called out, or before anybody tugged. That's unheard of in the pagan world. That's unheard of among the Greeks and the Romans. That from a distance, before we cry, before we call, before, before we tug, God has his eye on you. And he says, rise, rise. Well, that's what I want to talk about this morning. The call of Jesus on your life and mine, wherever it is that we are, to rise, to rise, to rise up and, and trust him. William Barclay was a great theologian of the Christian church and, and a great writer as well. During his life, his 21-year-old daughter was killed in a, a boating accident. She and her fiancé were both drowned in that accident. And he writes about it later. He says, God did not stop that accident at sea, but he did still the storm in my own heart so that somehow my wife and I came through that terrible time still on our own two feet. The day my daughter was lost at sea, there was sorrow in the heart of God. And then he goes on to say this. He says, when things like that happen, there are just those things to be said. First, to understand them is impossible. Second, Jesus does not offer simple solutions to them. What he does offer us is his strength and help somehow to accept what we do not understand. Third, the one fatal reaction is the bitter resentment which forever after meets life with a chip on the shoulder and a grudge against God. The one saving reaction is simply to go on trusting, simply to go on living, to go on working, and to find the strength and courage to meet life with steady eyes. 
and know that, that God is with us. The psalmist talks about that good shepherd, that good shepherd that is with us. He says that, that yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It doesn't mean that there is no evil. It doesn't mean that everything can always wind out all right. It, it means that Jesus is there. Before we cry out, before we call out, before we tug and you can trust him he is the good shepherd we can lean on you can trust him even in the darkest the darkest hardest times and it may be that there are some folks this morning that are in just those times hear the word of life you're not alone Jesus is, is there with you. Before you, you, you cry out, before you call out, before you tug, know that Jesus is there. You're not alone. And he gives strength that, that we don't have. Arise. Arise. Arise and trust him. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is is rise up and follow. Rise up and follow him. Dr. Paul Tournier wrote a book called A Doctor's Case Book in Light of the Gospel. In this book, he talks about a, a patient of his that was suffering from anemia. It was a woman that he had given a, a regimen of vitamins and diet and exercise, and she'd followed that regimen very closely. But even after following the regimen for a while, she he he found she wasn't getting any better. So he set a date, asked her to come to his office where they would take some blood and he'd run a battery of tests on her blood. The day came. She came to his office. They took her blood and he began to analyze her blood and after the battery of tests found that her, her blood still wasn't healthy at all. Well, he didn't understand the results. So he told the woman, he said, we need to set up an appointment at the hospital. You need to be checked in. And there they'll run another battery of tests, more extensive than I can. And, and maybe we can find out the problem there. Several days later, she checked into the hospital. They drew the blood. And, and when they began to analyze it and ran the battery of tests, he thought, well, this can't be right. So he had them run the tests again. And it wasn't at all what he had seen several days earlier, that this woman's blood was, was healthy, that it was strong. So he went to the woman and he asked her, has there been any significant change in your life between the time that you came to my office and the time you checked into the hospital? She said, oh, yes, there's been a definite change in my life he said tell me about that she said when you told me that I was going to have to check into the hospital I knew that I was getting worse and worse and I knew that I needed to get my affairs in order she went on to say that there was a relationship where a person did great harm to me she said I was un unable to forgive this person and over the years, I practiced that hurt. I nursed the injury. And that's all I could think about again and again and again was that hurt and that grudge that I had that, toward that person. She said, I called the person to see if I could reconcile the relationship. And they, she said, that was the change. It made all the difference and for the first time in my life I felt like I could live again I felt like I could live again that's what unforgiveness does it sucks the life out of us and that's why Jesus didn't wait till we cried out he didn't wait till we called out he didn't wait till we tugged on his 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 robe and said please will you will you give your life on the cross for us will you please 
It was before we cried, before we called, and before we tugged. Jesus gave his life on the cross for you and for me. He gave his life to forgive before we asked. To wipe away all those sins that are behind us and all those sins that are ahead of us. And here's the power of that forgiveness, that he rose from the grave to live his life through us, that we may also forgive. You see, he not only forgave you and me, he forgave others as well. The other that we might want to put into that jail of unforgiveness waiting for them to, to cry out to us, please forgive, and it doesn't come. Or maybe waiting for them to call out or, or to tug and say, please, won't you forgive me? We don't have power to forgive, but Jesus does. And when he rose from the grave, he rose to give that power to you and to me that we could forgive folks before they ask before they cry out, before they call out, before they, they tug. That we can let go and move on. It's a power. It's a power that we don't have on our own. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 It's the story of the, the prodigal son and it's the, the son that's that's wandered away to a distant country. It's a son who's hurt his family and hurt his father. But in verse 20, it says that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him. The son hadn't asked for forgiveness, but while he was still a long way off, his father felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. It's power, power that Jesus has for, for you and for me, a power that gives life. To let go of unforgiveness, to not, the strength to not practice unforgiveness. A practice to rise up and to forgive strength we don't have on our own. It's a strength that, give, that Jesus gives to you and to me. Rise up. Rise up and trust Him. Rise up and forgive. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is rise up and follow. Christopher was a nine-year-old boy. And by the time he was nine, he he had moved more than most people move in a lifetime. He had moved from the orphanage to a foster home and then back to the orphanage and then from the orphanage to another foster home and then back to the orphanage again and again and again. When Christopher was nine years old, a man and a woman adopted him. They embraced him and welcomed him into their family. They had three daughters, Gerilyn, Johanna, and Jana. And so immediately, Christopher had three sisters and a mother and a father that loved him and loved him dearly. And it seemed like it made all the difference in the world until Christopher, nine-year-old boy, did what nine-year-old boys often do. He messed up. He accidentally left the door open and the dog got out. And Christopher began to cry and cry. He was unconsolable. His mother and father tried to console him, but he just kept crying. And fin finally he, he said it. He said, please don't send me back. Please don't send me back. His mother and father said, never would we send you back. You're a part of the family. We love you, Christopher. Well, that consoled him for a while, but not long after, Christopher did what nine-year-old boys often do. He messed up. They were at dinner and he accidentally knocked 
his glass over. He made a mess of things and he began to cry. And the more he cried, the, the more he began to cry until he was unconsolable. And then he said it. He said, please don't send me back. They said, Christopher, we won't send you back. You're a part of the family. We love you. Never would we send you back. Well, that, that helped for a while until one day Christopher did what nine-year-old boys often do. Christopher messed up. He, uh, he came into the house with muddy, muddy shoes. He looked behind him and he could tell every step that he took on the carpet and he began to cry. And the more he, he cried, the the more he began to cry even more. And he was unconsolable. And till he said it. He said, please don't send me back. His mother and father said, never would we send you back. We're, you're a part of the family. We love you, Christopher. And that's when his family called a, a meeting. His father called a meeting of the whole family. His sisters were there. Christopher was there. His mom was there. And his father said, Christopher, we're having this family meeting just for you. We want you to pick your name. Without hesitating, Christopher said, I want my name to be Jay. My sisters are Gerilyn, Johanna, and Jana, and I want to be called Jay. I want a Jay name. From that day on, they called Christopher Jay. Later on, he went on to say, that's what made all the difference. That's when his life changed. That he felt a part of the family. This morning, you and I have an opportunity. An opportunity that it, it's possible you may have, have taken for granted. Because, well, nobody was crying out, nobody was calling out, and nobody was tugging. It's an opportunity to choose your name as a follower of Jesus Christ. That name is, is Christian. And the Bible is not silent about what that means. Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says, If you confess Jesus as Lord and believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Not you might be saved or you ought to be saved or, you know, if you're real good, you will be saved says you shall be saved. And that word saved, saved literally means rescued. Rescued from death and rescued for life. An abundant life. A life that has meaning and purpose because you belong. You belong to the family of Jesus Christ. You are his own possession is what the Bible says. You're as close as the, the vine is to the, the branch. A part of one another. That you belong. Well this verse says that if you confess with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. Lord means leader. It means that you, you say it to him. And that, that, for me it's not just once. It's. Several times a day that we'll follow, that we become, he's the leader of our lives. And that we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. Now, notice it says, believe with the heart. What goes on in the mind is, well, that's just a scent to maybe doctrine or certain. Things that we, we follow. To believe with the heart means to lean on, to rely on, to trust Him. That, that God raised Him from the dead. He's no longer on the cross. He's no longer in the tomb. He's alive. Because God raised Him from the dead today. And that He lives in, in you and me. Giving us strength that we don't have. And it very well may be that this morning... You've done what nine-year-old boys often do. You messed up. Or maybe you've done what 16-year-olds often do. You lost your nerve. Or maybe you're at that place where you've done what 39-year-olds often do. You've lost your way. Or maybe you're 
You've done what 60-year-olds often do. You've, you've made a fine mess of things. I have good news for you this morning. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And with you, if you confess with your mouth that he is your leader, he is your Lord, and you believe in your heart that he rose from the dead and, and that his spirit can live through, through you, he can get you out of that ditch. He can get you on the road. He can do what you can't do on your own when we begin to follow him as your leader, as your Lord. And this morning it may be that you've not done that. Or it's been a long time since you've done that. And you know you don't have the power to follow him on your own. Because you're in that ditch. Well, I want to pray with you and I want to pray with you now. Join with me. Jesus, you don't leave us alone. You don't leave us in the ditch. Even before we call, before we cry out, before we tug, that you're there. Give us that strength we need to follow. You forgave us before we asked for it, but very often we don't receive it until we ask, and we're asking now. You give us strength before we, we call out, but very often we don't receive it until we cry out. And we're at, crying out now. Jesus, you rose from the grave without asking our permission or if that would be a good thing. You rose because you have the power we need. And very often we just won't receive that power until we ask Lord we call out to you we cry out to you we tug on you now that your power your power may rise up in us and we trust you we rise up and we forgive others we rise up and we follow you we know we can't do it on our own and so we've pour out to you all those those ways that we've messed up, that we've blown it that we've lost our, our nerve and we've lost our way and we've made a fine mess of things Lord give us the strength to rise to rise and to rise now that we might know your rescue It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. 
We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you.